All right. Okay. Thank you, Drew. I'm honored to be here. Thank you, environmental volunteers, for bringing me today to teach you guys about California insect diversity. Um, as Drew said, my name is Stephanie, or Beetle Lady, or Dr. Dole, and I am a local entomologist. And I'm coming to you today from my office in San Mateo, California, right near the San Francisco airport. Um, and this is where I have all of my insect collections and a bunch of my live bugs. I was mentioning to Drew that I have two live bugs planned for us today. But if you, any of you have requests of something you really want to see, also in addition to that, that's something else we can do during the question and answer session. So let's go ahead and get started. I have prepared for you today a presentation that, oops, let's see, there we go. Hopefully it will be a good overview for a lot of you on insect diversity in California. It's always difficult to know what sort of um, crowd we're gonna have in terms of how much you already know about arthropod diversity or insects in general. Um, but I hope that this is something that's satisfying for all of you on many levels and you can ask questions at any level after that as well. Um, oops. Let's see, oh, there we go. Sorry, new computer. Apparently, I have to do a different thing to get my slides to advance. Um, so this is me. I am Stephanie Dole, and I am an entomologist, and I own a business called Beetle Lady. And through uh, my background is in entomology. I have my undergraduate from UC Davis and my PhD from Michigan State University. And as far as my research is concerned, I've always focused on beetles. I'm technically a coleopterist, a beetle specialist. And I look at the tropical diversity of bark beetles. These are the same beetles that are very important in our forest ecosystems that sometimes thanks to drought and a lot of the harm that have been caused to trees or because the beetles have been introduced as invasive species from places like tropical Southeast Asia, these um, beetles can become major forest pests and have uh, devastating ecological consequences. So that was kind of the, the reasoning behind having National Science Foundation to do my research on the diversity of these beetles in places like Ecuador and Thailand. Um, and to give you an idea what comes of that research, I, uh, my, my research work involves describing new species, also building evolutionary trees of the relationships among these species. And this is my most recent publication. I don't publish a lot because essentially I've left academia to be beetle lady and to do more education and outreach as my career. Um, but this was my publication last year about uh, the bark and ambrosia beetle fauna of uh, the Ecuadorian Amazon canopy, um, which was a wonderful research I got to conduct with the Smithsonian Institute. So that's kind of my background. And then in 2016, I founded Beetle Lady. I loved doing education and outreach, and that was always the thing that made me the happiest. And so I decided that that's what I wanted to do full time. So I go out in the community. I do educational programs for community groups. This is actually the San Mateo um, Mothers Club had a parents club, had a group um, that met at the park a few weeks ago, and I presented to them about insects and arachnids of the area. Um, I do library programs a lot, and I can tell you, thank goodness, the libraries are back, and I have uh, over 26 library programs. Uh, these ones are focused mostly for children. Um, this summer, uh, right when COVID hit, I was actually starting with the library. We were starting to schedule adult programs, so hopefully we'll resume scheduling those, but if you want to know when I'll be at the library to teach kids of different ages from preschoolers to older children, um, you can look on my website, beetalady.com, and see that schedule. I have specialty classes. This is one I present a lot this summer, which is Bugs of Pokemon. So I use the love of the game Pokemon that a lot of young people have developed, a lot of older people have developed, right? There's plenty of people my age I know who play Pokemon. Um, there's a lot of real science in this game. And so I use this as a tool for engaging people about insect biodiversity, making them realize that the real world can be and is every bit as fantastical and amazing and awe-inspiring and unbelievably crazy amazing as um, the world of things like Pokemon. I teach a regular high school class too, pretty much I teach all ages. Um, and this is a high school class that I teach uh, three times a year at Design Tech High School, which is in Redwood City at the Oracle campus. 
And an important part of what I do is to try to change hearts and minds about arthropods, to try to give people this chance to actually get to interact with some of these animals. So every single program I do, including what I'm going to do for you today, involves live um, arthropods. Um, if we're in person, people get an opportunity to really get up close and sometimes touch and hold them as well. And I really find that this is a key thing in changing people's attitudes about these animals. And also another really important thing to me is getting kids outside. Um, in fact, with that high school class I just showed you, one of the most delightful things is seeing how much, despite what we think of these teenagers on their phones all the time, how eager they are to put them down and go out and look at real things in the real world and hang out and run around with insect nets. So I get to do a lot of programs like this. This is at San Pedro Valley Park and I also have a program coming up there in person where we'll basically do what this girl is doing um, in a couple months, so. And then lastly, um, the thing that I developed, uh, sadly, I started developing right when COVID hit and then luckily it finally has come to be is I have a pop-up bug museum. So this basically is that you can rent um, a, if, you, if a community center or library or school or any place, corporation, anywhere that wants to have a pop-up museum for a day or more can basically, if they provide me with a space and about 12 tables, I can turn it into a museum for the day. So that is, that's my latest offering. And lastly, um, one of the things I do with adults a lot and I do just for myself for fun is I really love drawing insects. Insects are so beautiful and they always inspire me to create art. And so sometimes uh, my friends in the Lake local nature journal club will do bug drawing days. We'll go on buggy field trips together. They'll come to my house and draw the bugs in my collection, both living and dead. All right, so today we're here to talk about insects of California and California, we are incredibly lucky because we live in such a diverse state in so many ways. And many of you, if you're in this talk, I don't have to tell you that California has an incredibly diverse um, series of ecosystems of different types of biomes, of habitats like deserts and mountains and chaparral and ocean and coast and all of these different environments. We're a large state and we're also a very ecologically diverse state. So before we talk about what insects we have in California, let's do a little review, which may be a groan of a review for some of you, but let's, let's be sure we're all on the same page of understanding what insects are. Insects are arthropods. These are animals with um, exoskeletons. Literally the word arthropoda means joint footed, and that's because their skeletons are made of plates of this uh, armor that then have flexible parts in between in and out allowing them to move, right? You wouldn't make a robot out of one sheet of metal, one single solid piece of metal, you'd make it out of different pieces and give it joints and flexible bits in between. So these are all the animals that have what we call an exoskeleton, this hard skeleton on the outside rather than um, bones on the inside. Entomology, if you looked it up technically in the dictionary, it would tell you that entomology means the study of insects, but actually entomology deals with all terrestrial arthropods. So any of the arthropods that live on land, I end up studying and teaching about. There's a lot of arthropod diversity in the ocean. A lot of these are crustaceans. A few of them are um, things like chelicerates, like horseshoe crabs, which recently have been apparently suspected to be arachnids now, which is really cool. Um, and so uh, these include things. So for me on land, I end up teaching about crustaceans like millipede or like isopods, roly polies and wood lice, arachnids, which obviously are spiders, scorpions, ticks, mites, things like that, myriapods, which are centipedes and millipedes, and then of course all true insects. And the important thing about arthropods is this is 80% of all animal species. So if an alien landed on our planet and asked us what is an animal, it would be much more accurate to show them something like a scorpion or a beetle than it would be to show them a giraffe. And yet I constantly have people asking me, well, are insects animals? And then I say, well, what are they if they're not, right? But it's often a misconception, right? We don't think of them as animals. And yet they are what most animals look like. More animals look like this than like our mammals that we're so used to calling animals. 
And all insects are arthropods, but not all arthropods are insects. And since they asked me to talk about insect diversity today, and you could go on and really make a long talk if you include everything else, we're going to focus on insects today. But just know that within this group, they're all of their relatives. They are included in the arthropods, things like our native spiders, our scorpions, our millipedes and centipedes and wood lice and roly polies. So for something to be considered an insect, it has three body parts. Hopefully all of you learned this at some point in school. It has a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Insects always have six legs. They're one of the arthropod groups that really follow a very set formula of the number of legs that they have. This actually has to do with the evolution of their thorax, which is where all the legs are attached. Um, the thorax evolved from three ancestral body segments and brought with it three pairs of legs. So that's why this is a very strict number. It never changes. Insects have antennae. The reason that antennae are important is um, we take for granted the fact that we are covered in a sense organ. Our skin is full of nerves that give us information about the world around us constantly. Insects don't have that. Having an exoskeleton, I imagine, is very similar to wearing like a very thick leather gardening glove. You can kind of feel the outside world, but you don't have that same tactile um, input. Um, so insects have to have things that reach through the exoskeleton, and that's why some insects appear to have hairs on them. Those are often attached to nerves underneath. Um, their exoskeleton, but the antennae are this really key sense organ because of this. They are reaching out of the body and they have on them um, chemoreceptors, which is essentially taste and smell. They have thermoreceptors so they can tell if it's um, uh, if it's hot or cold. They have uh, hydroreceptors, they can tell, sense moisture. And they also have uh, tactile receptors. So kind of think of the antennae as being like your fingertips, your tongue, your nose, uh, all of these things combined together to, to tell you about, about the world if you're an insect. Insects have four wings. Um, if you're a true insect, there's a few primitive, really primitive groups like silverfish and things like that that have never evolved wings. But as far as the true insects, they all have wings. If they don't have wings, that means that they have secondarily lost them. So meaning if you see something like an ant species or a flightless beetle species, somewhere in the evolution of that species, they had wings. But at this stage, they have secondarily lost them. Um, so they, the wings are a, a component of all, um, of all insects unless they've lost them later on in their evolution. Um, and they have four wings. And again, this has to do with thoracic segments and stuff like that. So two pairs of wings. Sometimes some of them are, are dramatically reduced or altered in some way because as we're going to talk about, there are so many kinds of insects. So they don't all follow the same rules. And lastly, um, they have compound eyes. And these are these incredibly complex, multi-lens, multifaceted eyes that um, create a really complex picture of the world um, for the insects. Some insects have really great vision, others have horrible vision. It just depends on what their ecological role is. So now that we've established that, let's talk about how diverse insects are. Insect biodiversity is one of my favorite things to teach about because I think it is one of the most mind blowing facts about life on our planet that a, a sad, sadly few humans know about. So right now, me and my entomologist friends who do this kind of work, we're basically making a list of all the species that we find on earth. When a species is discovered for as far as science is concerned, it gets described, it gets a scientific Latin name and all of that. So when I talk about described species, that's what I mean. We have over 1 million different species of insects on this list. And because we're scientists, we can use uh, math and computers to estimate how many there might be. This is actually some of what the work I did in Ecuador was to not just find the beetles, but also estimate based on my data, how many there are total, um, including ones I hadn't found. And there, our lowest estimates give us 5 million species. So even if we're being super conservative, that means that for every five kinds of insects on our planet, we've discovered one of them and there are still four remaining to be discovered out in the world. And you can compare this to there are 10, about 10,000 species of birds in the world and 5,500 species of mammals. We're going to meet a kind of a beetle today for which its group there are 20,000 species. So there's more kinds of beetles in this one family that I'm going to show you today than there are um, all birds. So it's double that amount. 
So there's a few different ways um, to look at this. Uh, this is a, a figure that I really love from a textbook that I um, was taught from and taught students from when I taught at University of San Francisco. This is uh, from Penny Gullen and uh, Pete Cranston's book. And they have this drawing that shows everything's drawn in proportion to how many species there are. So you can see that enormous fly um, hovering above that tiny elk that includes all mammals, including us. Um, here's another way to look at it. These are all the known species of these animals in the world. And as you can see, insects far dwarf um, the other uh, species as far as numbers. And I like this diagram as well, because this diagram, the dark circle in the middle, is the known species, those described species that I talked about. And then the larger circle, the lighter blue circle around it is giving us the um, estimated diversity. And so that kind of shows the coverage. So for instance, with arachnids, um, we think we actually know a smaller percentage of arachnids than we know of insects. We think we know about 17% of the arachnid species on our planet. Insects were at about 20%. Again, this is if you go with that 5,000, some of our estimates give us even, even higher um, than that. I wanna show you one other way that I love teaching this. This is how I teach this concept to even really young, pretty young children, you know, first, second graders. So I'm gonna turn on my camera here. All right, so I, let's look at a number of species. So this is a mammal, this wolf, this little plastic wolf is a mammal, just like you and I are mammals. For every one kind of mammal like this wolf, there are two species of birds on our planet. There are twice as many different species of birds as there are mammals like us. For every one kind of mammal and two kinds of birds, there are two kinds of reptiles. So there are twice as many species of reptiles also as there are mammals like us. Now, if you're up on your taxonomy, you realize that we now know that birds are just living dinosaurs, right? And so these kind of all are lumped together in the same group. So you could, you know, really technically they should all be reptiles, but still a lot more than us, right? For every one kind of mammal, two kinds of birds and two kinds of reptiles, there are six species of fish. There are six times as many different kinds of fish on our planet as there are mammals like us. But this isn't where most of life is. Oh, I gotta zoom my camera out a little bit. It's in the arthropods. So for every one kind of mammal, two kinds of reptiles, two kinds of birds, six kinds of fish, there are 20 kinds of arachnids, spiders and scorpions, ticks, mites, things like that. And as you just saw in that previous slide, we're still working on how many species of arachnids there actually are in the world. And then again, for every one kind of mammal, two kinds of birds, two kinds of reptiles, six kinds of fish, and 20 kinds of arachnids, there are 200 kinds of insects. And the remarkable thing about this number is this is based on that 1 million described species. So this number is going up by the tens of thousands every year, depending on where scientific research funding is for fundamental exploration. But we are describing new species like crazy and this number is growing. Whereas the number of species of mammals is fairly static. Um, we get lucky enough to describe a new bird every few years, um, but not terribly, terribly often, relatively speaking. Okay, so let me move all my toys out of the way. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about why this diversity, and then I want to give you a little, oh, doesn't help if I just share the slideshow with myself, does it? Okay, here we go. Um, so why are there so many kinds of insects on our planet? There's a number of different um, reasons for this. And I'm gonna go over this really quickly. This can be a whole lecture in a class. Um, their size is a big part of it. Think about when we go out hiking in one of the, our local forests, that is a habitat for something like the, um, the California mountain lion or, um, or, or a lizard, right? It's the forest is their habitat. Whereas with insects, their size allows them to partition the habitat in much finer ways. So for an insect, that same forest, their habitat is gonna be maybe the leaf litter under certain trees or the water that it collects on certain mosses, or you, know, you can extrapolate that on to realize that then you're slicing up the habitat into much smaller partitions. So we think this is part of it. Um, another reason is their reproductive strategy, insects, 
uh, reproduce very quickly. They have a lot of offspring and so, and they have shorter generation times. So a lot of this leads to much more rapid evolution as you can imagine. Their evolutionary timing is just was just good. We just happened, what we see now as insects in our modern world were the result of some of the first arthropods and for some of the first animal life to colonize land. So this, they were just the ancestors of the, the fundamental colonizers of land from the ocean when it comes to animal life. And so that's a really big deal as well. There are three really key moments in insect evolution that we see an explosion in diversity at, on these points in the insect's evolutionary tree. The first is the evolution of flight. So you have things like this damselfly here that I'm holding up. I hope some of you can see me and, and, my, and my screen also. Um, this is like a damselfly, or sorry, this is a dragonfly. Um, these have the very primitive type of insect wings. They're actually called Paleoptera because of this like paleontologists, old winged insects. Um, so when wings show up at all, this is a big deal. If you're a small animal, this is very important for dispersal in the environment. The ability to fold their wings is the next thing because you will never see a dragonfly folding its wings nicely. They have to walk around with their wings sticking out like this and they get jacked up and messed up on plants and things like that. So that limits where they can go. Whereas you have something like this fly that can fold its wings neatly over its back. Think of, you know, our honeybees. A honeybee would never be able to live in a hive and go in there and be in those cramped spaces if its wings were stuck out permanently. So this is when we see another huge explosion in diversity. And lastly, the evolution of metamorphosis, which going back to talking about partitioning the environment, one of the reasons we think this leads to so much success is that here's another way they can partition the environment. You can have something like a caterpillar that feeds on leaves be in the same exact habitat as its parent who feeds on nectar of flowers and they're not competing with their own offspring. So now they're partitioning the environment within their own lifetimes again in a different way so they can do that even further. Um, of course, we see a huge explosion on the evolutionary tree of life for insects when it comes to the evolution of flowering plants. And so we see this huge explosion. In fact, this is the point in time where we start to see a lot of the modern um, taxonomic families that we can recognize still to this day, um, because this is when a lot of them were established because of flowering plants and insects having such a closely tied relationship. Um, the latest one is, this is an interesting one because this one's a newer one that I didn't always teach, but there have been a lot of papers that have shown that insects actually have, a, have lower rates of background extinction compared to other types of organisms, meaning that while other groups of organisms lose, lose or shedding species constantly, insect species tend to be more robust and so they are accumulating at a, a, a greater rate than having a lot of species go extinct. Now that's not to say that insects are resilient to extinction and especially not in the current um, situation that we're finding ourselves in where they're facing dramatic changes in the environment. Okay, so before we start looking at some beautiful insects from California, here um, are a, little, a few things about the diversity of insects in California. We have over 100,000 species of insects recorded from California which if you're paying attention means that we have about a 10th of the world's described insect species in California. Now that's gonna change because we're gonna find a lot of insect diversity in the tropics as we further explore it. This has a lot to do with how much un unexplored areas there still are in places like the Amazon, but um, that's still a really remarkable number. And you can compare this to, we have 223 species of mammals in California and 641 birds. California is also, we have a lot of unknown species diversity because our state insects can be active year round in much of the state. Um, and also, even though we're a heavily populated state, we tend to see in insect collections the same patterns of human travel as you would see in anything else. So we have areas that are very well collected that are major landmarks where people like to go. We have areas that are well collected where certain entomology classes go, but then those are only well collected in one temporal sense, right? What time of year those classes go there? And then the rest of the year, we may know nothing about the diversity in that area or very little compared to it. So there's still a lot of exploration to be done in California. All right, so I'm gonna give you some photos um, of insects in um, California that we have. Um, 
So we have a lot of diversity. I'm gonna show you some of the minor groups. Of course, we have odinates, which are dragonflies and damselflies. This is a damselfly that I photographed at Memorial Park last weekend. Yeah, I got to go camping there last weekend um, up near Pescadero. We have a lot of hemiptera, which are true bugs. These are insects that have a, a long piercing sucking proboscis. Think of them kind of like plant mosquitoes. They have, they pierce and suck most of them plant juices, although there are some um, like this assassin bug that are uh, predators of other insects. And so they'll go and hunt them down and stab them with that mouth part. Um, cicadas are also included in this group. And yes, even though we don't have kind of the deafening cicada numbers that you have in some parts of the world and on the East Coast, we do have cicadas here. They tend, they're not periodical in the same way. So you, you have them much more dispersed through the environment. Um, and this time of year, you'll see a lot of these. These are the shed skin of these cicadas. When they emerge from the ground, um, they'll pull themselves out of these skins. So if you see these around, these are a great thing. If you're a docent, you, you know, grab one of these and collect them, put them in a jar to show uh, kids or uh, other people visiting your area. This is one of my favorite ones. I wanted to show you a photo of this. These are an interesting group of insects that we have a lot of in Northern California, especially as the summer progresses, we'll start to see a lot of them. Um, they're called snake flies. They're their own group called the Raphidioptera. They are characteristic, uh, have this characteristic long snake-like neck. And an interesting thing about this group that I really love is that for almost all insect groups, the, there's way more diversity in tropical regions of the world. This is a unique group in that they are a temperate insect group. So we don't have any of these at all in places like the Amazon. We have a lot of them in places like North America. So um, they're really interesting. And I just think they're so beautiful looking and they look kind of scary. I always love insects and arachnids that look kind of scary to some people. And so then you can kind of teach them that they're not um, the, the truth about them and to not worry about them as much. Um, I want to hopefully change your hearts and minds a little in just one slide about cockroaches and termites. Um, these are now considered the same group. It used to be they were two different groups, but uh, cockroaches, we've now, uh, termites we've realized now are just kind of cockroaches or, uh, with fancy social lives. And we actually do see a lot of intermediate steps towards sociality in the cockroaches. This little guy right here is a sand uh, cockroach from Anza Borrego area in far Southern California. Um, we also have here where I live on the peninsula, a number of species of wild cockroaches that live up in the woods and that never, ever, ever have any interest in getting in our homes. Even if you're living in some place like Woodside, these will not invade your kitchen. So um, cockroach diversity is really important and, um, and they play really great roles in ecosystems as decomposers. This is a, another favorite bug that I got to meet at Anza Borrego. This is a predatory katydid. So Orthoptera is a group of um, insects that has, and I should mention all of these categories that I'm naming are orders of insects. Um, and Orthoptera is our grasshoppers, our crickets, and our katydids. Uh, hop, I always remember is like hop. Um, and this is a predatory katydid, which is pretty, uh, not the most common um, lifestyle for them. They're usually herbivores. So I wanna introduce you, yay, finally a live bug. Um, I wanna show you a live bug from, um, that's local around here. Um, I love this insect because it is so um, often bewildering to people and just very interesting and charismatic. Um, this is the Jerusalem cricket. They have a lot of different names. They're called the child of the earth, the old bald headed man and the potato bug. Um, they're also in Mexico called Niña de la Tierra, which means child, uh, which is literally child of the earth. And in Mexico, there is folklore around them that believes that they contain the souls of deceased children. And so there's a lot of superstition around do not step on these, do not harm them, um, don't do anything like that. They do have a good pinch, especially when they get large, um, but they're otherwise harmless. Um, and this actually, this particular uh, girl was one I had during the pandemic, one of my friends found her while walking her dog. And so she was found right here in my neighborhood in San Mateo and she was a great teaching bug for a while. So let me show you, I'm gonna just go ahead and I can tell you all of this while we're looking at the bug because we wanna look at some bugs today. Okay, let me get out my Jerusalem cricket for you. 
these are not the easiest things to identify to species. And so usually I just know that, okay, I've got a stenothal matted, but I don't know exactly what species it is. Let's find him in here. Where are you, buddy? Maybe I should have left him out before. <laughs> I know he's in here. We checked before you guys logged in. Oh, Jerusalem cricket. Ah, there he is. Actually, I said he, yeah, on the mail. Okay, let me turn on my camera here so you can see him. So these, there's, and also I'm going to mention at the end, uh, KQED Deep Look, which is an incredibly uh, well done, locally produced short television uh, show of, uh, for public television here about different local arthropods, and they do a great amount of storytelling, and they have a great one about how these drum to each other um, in courtship. So Jerusalem crickets are interesting because they are not a cricket and they don't live in Jerusalem. <laughs> and so um, their names it kind of is a great example of how common names are pretty, pretty awful sometimes. Um, they are flightless. So again, like I said earlier, somewhere in the evolution of these, their ancestors did have wings, but they don't need them anymore because they crawl around in the dirt, um, eating roots of plants and things like that. Um, so if you see one of these out, you're usually either out late at night or maybe you've been digging. Um, my theory, when I first got that big one that my friend found while walking her dog, um, a bunch of my entomologist friends immediately assumed that since it had been out during the day, it was infested with a parasite called a horsehair worm. And thankfully it turned out it wasn't. So I, because those horsehair worms will cause them to wander around in broad daylight when they really shouldn't be wandering around. Um, but it turned out it did not have the horsehair worm um, and it lived, you know, a long life. So um, yeah, this, this one, um, what else was I going to say? Oh, um, I think that one was just disturbed by dogs sniffing through the, the bushes and stuff like that on the Bay Trail. Um, so yeah, and this is a good way to demonstrate if any of you are wanting to hold insects out in the wild. Um, one of the main techniques, one of my main pieces of advice I can give you is notice it's this has a good, good set of jaws and it could give me a good pinch. Those jaws don't open up because I'm not holding it down. I'm not making it feel restricted. I'm not so bold, but I have some friends who will even do this with something like a tarantula hawk and just know that it won't sting them unless it, they make it feel restrained. But as soon as I put my fingers down and restrain it, that's when the jaws start to open. That's when the pinch might happen. So that's, that's my number one bug holding tip. Um, but yeah, I love these guys. They're one of the largest insects we have, as you saw with that picture of the one I used to keep. I named her Large Marge. Um, she was much bigger than this even. So they're really remarkable. Okay, we'll let him go and go back to... Okay. Oops, where am I? Let me be sure I'm sharing the right thing. Share screen. There we are. Okay. Uh, so now when you have insect diversity, if you learn four groups of insects, you're going to be covering over 85% of insect diversity because there are four groups of insects that have the most number of species. Um, the first one of these are the Hymenoptera, the ants, bees, wasps, and this funny little primitive group called sawflies that are like a thick waisted wasp. Um, these include some really gorgeous, oh, I should mention that uh, the, the yellow-faced bumblebee. This one is one that I found uh, with my students right on the Oracle campus, right in Redwood Shores. Um, so this is one you see commonly around here a lot. Um, this gorgeous insect is a tarantula hawk. We have these in the San Francisco Bay Area. This particular one was for more Southern California, but these will, um, they basically parasitize tarantulas. The females will find one, lay her egg on it um, and uh, paralyze it and drag it into a burrow, lay her eggs on it and then seal up the burrow and the babies will eat this zombie tarantula um, while it's still alive. Um, I believe this one is a male because typically the females have curly antennae and the male have straight antennae. Um, which would mean that this one can't sting because only the females can sting. Uh, this is a beautiful little ichneumon wasp that I saw while um, walking around at Memorial Park last weekend. 
um, your Pescadero. A lot of wasps like this, you see that very formidable looking stinger. Um, that is actually her ovipositor. All stingers are actually ov modified ovipositors, which are the egg laying tubes. That's why only females can sting and males can't. But in the case of this one, um, she's not very big. My camera is doing a good job of magnifying her, but that is used as an egg laying tube. It is not used as a stinger. Um, we also have amazing things like this velvet ant, which is actually a female wasp. She's wingless. If you ever see one of these with wings, it's a male. And if you um, are brave enough to believe me on that, you can pick it up and touch it and hold it. He will pretend he is stinging you by buzzing at you and pushing his abdomen against you, but he cannot sting. Um, so these are pretty remarkable and have a very, very good sting. They're sometimes called cow killers because their sting is so potent. The next of our big four groups are uh, Lepidoptera. Those are moths and butterflies. This is a local skipper, which are kind of a chunkier, hairier group of these. Um, this is a tortricid moth, a little local tortricid moth, um, and another a butterfly. And of course, because of their beauty, we have a lot of uh, beautiful caterpillars in California. I feel like California, uh, and this is true almost everywhere, Butterflies, if you really want to learn some insects and you get frustrated by not being able to identify a species without having to have a microscope and take an entomology class, butterflies are the good one to, to do that with because we have really great field guides for them. They're pretty, most butterflies and some moths are pretty easily identifiable just from their wing patterns. Um, you get into some other groups of them and you, and you do have to be an expert to identify them to species. Uh, flies, I think flies are, are underloved. I mean, this fly, I have a crush on him. Um, don't tell my husband, he's really cute. Look at him. I mean, this is adorable. This is a surfeit fly. Um, I just think he's just great. Look at that face. Um, flies will have these incredibly weird bodies too. There'll be these funny big headed flies whose heads seem completely and eyes seem completely out of proportion with the rest of them. Um, another, another beautiful little fly. This one is also from Memorial Park last weekend. Um, crane flies. These are the ones that sometimes people call mosquito eaters. This one here is demonstrating one of the ways that they escape predators, which is they lose their legs really easily. So you can see there's two stumps where there should be legs. Um, and these are, these do not eat mosquitoes. Um, in fact, a lot of times they don't eat anything as adults. That's very common in insects to only eat in your larval stage. Um, and then the adult is merely for reproduction. And um, a lot of the flies you'll see around here, you might think are bees, like this uh, beautiful little surface fly. Um, these are incredibly good pollinators and really important um, and a huge part of our pollinator diversity. Okay, the last thing I wanna say um, about diversity are beetles, because beetles are the best, because I think they are, because I'm a, a coleopterist. So um, beetle diversity is, is pretty remarkable. There's over 350,000 described species of beetles in the world, and they can be diagnosed by this feature. Beetles have wings that cover up their hind wings, their flying wings. So these hard wings on this yellow beetle um, this is a little weevil, and um, its hard wings are basically, a, the front wings have become this shell, they're called elytra, and they act as a protective case for those delicate flying wings underneath. So you can see this weevil popping out his wings, they're actually folded under, double folded like origami under those uh, flying wings, and this is how he is able to fly. And this is huge for beetles because remember that dilemma with our dragonfly, how its wings might get all torn up and things like that. Well, in the case of these um, of beetles, they not only can fold up their wings, they can fold them up and put them in a nice protective hard case, which is why beetles are very good at um, living in all sorts of things. Some I have beetles in an aquarium right behind me. They carry air bubbles under their um, wing cases, and then they can fly out of the pond if the pond becomes polluted or they want to distribute themselves in the environment. Um, they can also uh, beetles can be in dung, they can be under wood, they can, you know, they can crawl down in the dirt, they can be all sorts of places. And then still, when they're ready to fly, pop, pop out those beautiful wings. Um, the thing about beetle diversity that's so incredible is um, they are a huge part of our animal and plant diversity on our planet. If you lined up every species on earth, every fifth species would be a beetle and every 10th species would be a weevil, which is a kind of beetle. So 
I count the world like this. I see living things and I go, one, two, three, four, beetle. One, two, three, four, weevil. So this is a huge part of biodiversity on our planet are within the beetles. And the weevils are um, one subgroup of beetles and uh, bark beetles are actually included in that group. So a few beautiful beetles from around California. This is a darkling beetle. You're gonna meet some live ones in a moment. I'm actually not sure what this guy is yet. I gotta run and buy some friends. I took his picture last weekend too. I don't know. Um, this is a local uh, firefly relative. So this is a lampyrid beetle. That's what fireflies are. That is my number one entomological wish for California is that we had uh, fireflies that light up as adults and fly in California, but we don't really. We have some where the larvae glow. Um, I'm not sure about this species, if the larvae glow or not, um, but this is a beautiful local firefly. Um, this is one of my favorite local beetles that it's an introduced species, but they're so cool to see because they're really large. You might not realize it's a beetle because it has these shortened wing cases. Um, so it, it kind of looks almost earwiggy in a way. Um, I've just invented a word apparently. Um, and uh, they, they are called Staphylinid beetles and these have a really great name. They're called the devil's coach horse beetle. And they usually live in pairs under rocks and things like that. And they have little stinky white glands that they'll push out at you when you're, if you bother them. Uh, we have a lot of predatory beetles. This is a carabid beetle. They're a really amazing predatory beetle. Um, we have a lot of you are probably familiar with this. This is a tenline June beetle. Um, they're a beautiful scarab beetle um, in California. Um, this another beautiful little scarab beetle. So you don't have to go to the tropics to see beautiful jeweled scarab beetles. Um, this is a really interesting group of beetles. They're called Maloid beetles or blister beetles. These are the beetles that'll make a chemical called cantharin that will um, cause blisters on your skin. And uh, this is an unusually shaped, well, this is kind of a very typical Maloid shape, but it's a weird looking beetle, right? Um, this is another relative of it that lives in the same area in Southern California. And then um, this, I love this picture because it shows you, this is what it does. I was bothering this beetle, by, it was in a light tent to take its photo and then released. Um, and you know, you're poking around at them, trying to get them to pose for you. And this one put up its wings and showed those warning colors underneath its um, elytra, that bright red patches that tell me I could hurt you. I've got, I've got a chemical defense. Um, uh, this is a, a cute little uh, chrysomelid leaf beetle that one of my stu high school students brought into this school and we were taking photos of it and she just adored seeing it up close. Um, and I love this little guy. I was teaching at the Atherton um, Earth Day Festival on Earth Day a few weeks ago, and a little kid brought this beautiful shiny weevil up to me, really small, like the size of a grain of rice. And I always, always, always carry a bug jar with me. So it went in the bug jar and went home with me. And this is literally on the desk that I am teaching you from right now. I just put some leaves from my yard and got some great photos of this beetle and he's showing his characteristic beetle feature of those elytra and then the wings underneath. And then I let him go in my garden. Okay, I wanna show you one last living thing and then hopefully um, we'll have a little time for um, some chat. We did have a couple slides about diversity, how we preserve diversity. So hopefully we can maybe go five minutes and I'll, I'm willing to stay later um, so I can say everything. Um, so I wanted to show you some tenebrionid beetles. These are called darkling beetles. And this is the group that I mentioned that there are uh, 20,000 species in the world and um, new ones being described all of the time. In fact, one of my colleagues, uh, Dr. Aaron Smith at Purdue, this, his whole lab works on these. Um, as of 2014, there are 447 California species. Basically in order, the reason I didn't, haven't told you guys numbers of a lot of these groups for California is it's almost impossible to have them unless somebody has recently done like a revision of the group and actually said, this is how many species are from California. So let's look at some of these tenebrionid beetles really quick. Uh, this is a fun group because they're very local and you will see a lot of them around. You've probably encountered a few of these if you're a hiker um, and called them uh, stink beetles or picante beetles. Um, this is an Iliotes species and what they will do to defend themselves is, I don't know if he'll do it for me right now. Some of them are more willing to do it. Let me see, I've got a button. Oh, this guy does it a lot when I bring him out. Here he is, he's striking the pose. See that? So that is 
letting us know I can make a nice stinky chemical out of my back end that's going to smell really bad. And so he'll do that. He'll march around with that back end up when I bother him and let me know that he can make a pretty good smell. Not all tenebrionids make a, a stinky smell. Um, some of them do not. We have, I have a few local species in here also that um, these ones I get a lot um, with students that I go uh, around in the hills of Belmont with for a homeschool group I teach with. And he's more just interested in running away than making a stink. Um, this guy's really mellow. And then another one of the main um, defenses that these guys will have is death feigning. So a lot of these beetles will do, oh, he's not on camera. There you go, buddy. They will do this as a defense. They will pretend to be dead. You can kind of see him moving and you can tell that he's just bluffing us. Um, and then now there he is. He's willing to be kind of alive. Um, these are my favorite things to recommend uh, people get as pets for kids because they are so hardy and so tough and, you know, so easy to take care of. And a kid could squeeze them in their hand and they can't hurt them. Um, and they're desert adapted. So we have thousands of species um, of these in the world and hundreds in California, I, I'd imagine that that number is pretty low and that we will have at least a thousand species of these in California when all is said and done and they've all been described. Okay, let me go back to... I wanna really quickly, I'll, I will stay later for questions as long as people are okay with that because I wanna really quickly just tell, show you a few slides about uh, conservation of insects in California. Um, so you now that hopefully, I know this was an extremely rough overview, but um, how are we gonna conserve all of this diversity? If, we, if, if I've gotten you to care about it, what can you do to make sure it still exists in our beautiful state? One of the most important things is changing attitudes. And this is a story I'm gonna preach about ever since I heard about it. Um, sometimes during the pandemic was when I read this story and it just shocked the hell out of me, I have to tell you. So I grew up in Los Angeles in the 1980s. And a big thing that we learned a lot about in school in Los Angeles was the wonderful recovery effort that was being done for the California condor. The Los Angeles Zoo played a major role in this, right? So as school children, we were given all of these stories about these condors and how we were bringing them all in from the wild and we were breeding and the people with the puppets feeding the condors and all of that heartwarming stuff. And then they um, released them. And now we know we have a much more healthy California condor population and it is not uh, threatened with extinction in the same way that it was back then. One of the things that they did when they brought in all of the California condors to the Los Angeles Zoo was they deloused all of them. And they knowingly made their louse species, the California condor louse, go extinct. So this is, to me, a stark demonstration of how our attitudes can be incredibly different about two different species. This was a conservation program that was dedicated to preserving a species, and it knowingly created the extinction of another species. Now, nobody loves having lice, but California condors and their lice were co-evolved. They don't kill the condors. They weren't going to adversely affect the condors health to the point where it wasn't going to be okay to introduce them into the wild. I'm sure there are other lice that are figuring out how to be on California condors, maybe at this point or in the future. But, you know, ask yourself, how do I feel about this? And what does that say about how I value different species and what I consider a species that is worthy of protection and one that isn't? Um, captive rearing and release of insects is an important thing. This is my friend Tim Wong. He's a really awesome biologist at California Academy of Sciences. He's in charge of the invertebrates and that gorgeous butterfly house that they have. But totally outside of his paid job, Tim has done captive breeding and release of pipevine swallowtails in his own yard in San Francisco. It's an amazing story. There's a lot of news coverage on it. Um, I encourage you to look at it. And, it, and so this can be uh, one way that we can help with insect conservation. There can be issues with this. You may have heard that there are some problems with captive monarchs being released, not migrating properly. Um, so that's something to, there are definitely little tiny things we may not be considering in the complexity of these systems when we do this, um, but it is one way that we can conserve insect life. 
one of the really positive things is that even though um, there's a lot of charismatic things in the world that entomologists go, oh, everybody just wants to save the tiger. Well, you know what? We have to realize if we protect the forest for the tiger, we're also protecting the forest for the beetles. So as long as we hitchhike on these other conservation efforts, we talked about all those ecosystems that exist in the forest for all the insects there. So that's really important um, as well. So just it's okay to, to preserve things for the more charismatic things that people more easily love because the insects are there too. Um, and there's a few unique things though with insect conservation. When it comes to insects, we're all kind of like little park rangers. Even if you live in an apartment building, you can plant flowers on your patio or balcony that will um, promote local insects. Um, if you are fortunate enough to have your own small plot of land or large plot of land, you can make some really important choices in your garden that can make a difference. Um, one of those is planting native California plants. They have a lot of benefits as we're looking at more drought years in California, of course. They're um, more drought tolerant. They're tolerant to our um, climate and they're easier to maintain. And I can tell you as somebody who tore out my front lawn um, seven years ago that I, even having taught about this, it really blew me away, the amount of biodiversity that I now see in my yard that I don't see in other parts of my neighborhood. Um, my, my yard is teeming with insects. Um, and these can create, even if you just have a little bit of this, this creates a corridor that the insects can travel in. Um, and if you want more information, we're really lucky in California. We have this great website called Calscape. Calscape talks about native plants. And you can also look at what pollinators. So you can say, I live here. I want to have host plants for these butterflies. And it'll tell you what, to, what you can plant for that is um, native to your specific region. And then one other small thing we can do is to not be so quick to manicure our yards entirely. Um, leaf litter, for instance, is a natural ground cover that provides really valuable habitats. So if you can, I in my yard, I'll break up leaves that are on the concrete parts in my yard, but I'll leave the leaves that are under bushes and that creates a really important habitat. Um, I mentioned this before, I just want to say this. Um, if you don't know Deep Look, their videos are incredible. I got to help with their one on vinegaroons recently. And um, if you work as a docent or a volunteer for environmental groups, or you're a nature journaler or anything like that, um, or just somebody who's curious or has a child who's curious about arthropods, these little short five, six minute videos are awesome. And so many of them are filmed right here in the Bay Area with insects and arachnids and other small creatures that live right here. So they can be great stories that you can tell people about uh, native wildlife. And with that, I promise I will stay as long as you have questions. <laughs> um, uh, I think Rob, I'll sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I go long, I went long. No, that's perfectly okay. I'll go ahead, just <laughs> jump in and say a couple words. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us today. That um, presentation was fantastic. We'll just give a quick round of applause for, for Stephanie here. Um, and um, we will go into Q&A. If you can stay longer, we welcome you too. Of course, if you have to head out, that's okay too. Um, we were the environmental volunteers. I'll post our link in the chat again. We encourage you to check us out. Um, if you're interested in becoming a volunteer, getting involved as a nature science educator like Stephanie. Of course, Stephanie has so much experience and knowledge. It was wonderful having her, but um, it's great to get started and we can certainly provide training to help help you on your journey as well, because nature science educators are very needed right now. So um, with that, I think I'll turn it over to question and answers. Um, go ahead and use the chat and I'll be reading um, questions that are put in there along with a couple of the other ones that we skipped towards the end. Um, but also I am going to, um, to allow people to unmute themselves. Um, because we do have a small group. If you want to just ask the question on muting, um, you can go ahead and do that. Just wait till people are done talking. So let me just go ahead and read a couple of the questions we skipped over um, here. Uh, Audrey asks, do we have native dung beetles in California? Yes, we do. We have a lot of native dung beetles. We even have some that are, are rather beautiful. Yeah, so there's a lot of native, Sometimes the stories of dung beetles get told as if they all live in Africa and feed on elephant dung, but we have a lot mm -hmm. of really great little local native dung beetles, yeah. 
Okay, and then another question, what kind of camera and lens do you use from Judy? Oh yeah, um, I might have to look up the exact lens, um, but I can, you know what I can recommend too is, um, so the I have a, a Canon, it's a digital uh, SLR, and then I have their main macro lens. I also have, the, they have this one, it's, it's called it's kind of like having a microscope on your lens on your camera so it's a really tricky one some of my friends are really um good at that if you want me to i can look up the exact model number i'm not like uh, as much of a geek about all those things i just know it works um but my recommendation is that i learned my insect photography skills um through a group called bug shot um so b-u-g-s-h-o-t um, I'm about to go to Montana with them for a weekend next month. They do two workshops a year. One is uh, in the United States and one is international. And basically you get to be in the field with world-class macro photographers. So people who've been published in things like National Geographic and Science Magazine who have um, incredible skills and it's a really great time. The, the, they usually, it, it, they go all over. I've gone to Ecuador with them. I went to Anza Borrego with them and I'm going to Montana with them. Um, so bugshot.org is the website. Um, and I highly recommend um, them as, as a place to learn. There are um, those local workshops. Uh, they usually are like $800 and that includes lodging and food for a three day workshop. And um, and you just have to deal with your airfare or transport there. So it's it's pretty worthwhile. You learn so much from them. And they also do natural history lectures while you're there. So it's a great experience. But yeah, if you want to email me, beetlelady.com, I have a contact. I can get you the exact model number. It's a Canon. It's their main macro photography um, lens. Okay, perfect. Um, interesting questions here. How do insects breathe when burrowing in the dirt? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, they, you know, they manage, <laughs> they manage. Uh, insects have air holes. Um, so insects don't breathe through their heads at all. They have these sphericals or air holes that um, start on the second thoracic segment and then go down the sides of their body. They're paired, they're on each sides of the body. So I think that helps in that, like, rather than just having one area where you have oxygen can come through. And also their tracheal, I mean, this is their, the way that they breathe through these closed tracheal tubes that run like pipes through their body is a lot more passive than our sucking in breath that we do and which is part of why their size is limited by their that's the number one thing that limits their ability to grow bigger than they do um, we think that the big big dragonflies that existed during the times of the dinosaurs existed because the oxygen levels were higher so i think that really helps yeah Right. And then um, Ronan wants to know what make clicks what makes click beetles so color colorful. Oh yeah, yeah. Click beetles can be really, really colorful. Um, I have some click beetles in my hand. Here, let's grab a click beetle. Yeah. These are some of the pop-up museum displays. Let's see, sometimes it all doesn't always go great with the glass. Let's see if we can zoom in and I'll show some of you who may not know what a click beetle is. Oop, no, not share screen. What are doing? There. Oh, hey, I focused right in on them. These are some click beetles right here. And some of them can get quite like metallic and colorful like that. Click beetles are, they all have kind of this interesting shape. I've heard some people describe it as kind of bullet shaped. I don't know. There's got to be a better name for that because it's not quite that. It's, and it's not quite a football either. But this kind of like long elongated elliptical shape. And they actually have this mechanism where they can click. Um, it's it's a little spring loaded or not. It's not spring loaded. It's a little a little mechanism on their underside where they can snap their bodies and it pops them up in the air um, if they're on their backs. And so it serves the dual purpose of allowing them to um, right themselves if they've on their backs and also to scare um, away predators. A lot of the time when you see an, a beetle that's like that, that has that metallic color, what you're seeing is what's called reflective coloration. So rather than there being a pigment and beetles do this a lot, um, that a lot of other insects do it as well, but beetles are one of the masters of it. They have um, microstructures of their exoskeleton that reflect the light back at your eye. Um, and that's why often when you tilt these metallic insects, the 
the color that you see changes. It can go from green to violet to yellow um, because it's actually light reflection and not at all pigment, um, which means they don't fade either. So that's an interesting aspect of it too. It's kind of think of it like a sequin. Um, yeah, but I don't, you know, some of these beetles that are so colorful, um, they have warning colors. Some click beetles can be like red and orange or yellow and black, and they can let you know that they taste bad. Other ones are the reflective coloration, even though a metallic green seems kind of showy to us. When you see it in the rainforest, it's really obvious that it's very good camouflage because when you have all of these wet, slick, different colors of green leaves, it makes it very hard to make out the insect's outline. Yeah, so hopefully that answered that. A quick question from Kathy. How many number of unknown species are estimated and how do we know the, how do we get that estimation? Yeah, so without going too crazy into the statistics, because they're really, even I have trouble with them a lot of the time. Um, they, it's essentially like if you're going to go out into Africa and you are going to try to guess how many giraffes there are in a population, you are not going to actually count all the giraffes. What you're going to do is you're going to do a mark release recapture study. So you will catch giraffes, put a little tag on them some way, release them, and then keep doing that for a while. And sometimes you're going to recapture the same giraffe, and other times you're going to, you know, get giraffes you've never seen before. Instead of thinking of individual giraffes, think of these as species. So what we do with these computer programs is we, there are several different algorithms. So, you know, like a good scientist, you don't just try one, you take your data and you put them in several different ones and then you compare the results. Um, so what we do is we consider a uh, species to be um, one of these data points and then how often we encounter new species and through these statistics they can it, these computer algorithms help us figure out um, which uh, which what our actual number of species are and so it depends really like when you get the 20,000 that's when people like my colleague that I worked with in Ecuador Terry Irwin from the Smithsonian he put in data for like huge groups of insects and his numbers were astronomically high um, and a lot of people were a little doubtful of those but even when you're being really conservative it's it's pretty remarkably high um, and like for the bark beetles that I had um, we had before I did the study there were less than 50 species known from Ecuador in that group and then we found 350 what we call morpho species which means we looked at them and uh, parse them out to different species. Usually morpho species are just, they're just looking at the physical characteristics. And so sometimes, uh, more often than not, it's an underestimate because you have things like the genitalia is different or other finer features of the genetics are different. And you're not able to physically just with your eyes see that that's a different species. And so then we knew there were 350 and then using the data that we collected, it estimated um, depending on the area, it was a thousand to 1500 species um, that actually live there. So it's a guess, but it's an educated guess. So yeah, and, and we do think the majority of unknown species are insects um, because of that's the biodiversity. Um, of course, when you get into single celled organisms and things, we can't even begin to even have any ideas there. All right. Um, here's a good question from Judy. Can you talk about ethics? I see you stay away from killing them as folks used to. How do you think about this in your work as for pets or for demos? Yeah, that's a great, you know, it, you're seeing me in this setting. If you came to the pop-up bug museum, you'd see a lot of dead bugs with pins in them. Um, and most of the bugs that I have, um, I basically the foundation for the pop-up bug museum was the insect collections that I did as an undergraduate. Um, when you are studying entomology at that, that level, um, you really, there's no substitute for pin specimens. We just can't learn to identify insects to the family level without using a microscope and a dead specimen. It, it just doesn't, it, the way that the characteristics are and all of that. Um, so a lot of entomologists, like myself included, have a little bit of an ethical struggle with it because, you know, you, you kill a lot of insects from time to time with your job. And then at the same time, like that Ecuador sampling, that was all canopy fogging. We were literally shooting insecticide up into the rainforest canopy. Now it was a very fast um, biodegrading pyrethrin insecticide that, um, that was basically neutral 
by noon that day. Um, but we collected thousands of insects to do that sampling. Um, we only did it a few times and and then and the areas recovered fine and all of that. It was just a few different trees to sample and that sort of thing. But there, there is an ethical dilemma about it. Um, for me, that's part of why I do what I do because then the specimens have a broader value. They, you know, in an insect collection, they should have a research value and they should be preserved and taken care of so that future scientists can use them. And that's pretty remarkable. When I was just, an, an, when I was a graduate student, um, I graduated in 2008. When I wanted to sequence DNA, I had to get fresh specimens. Now we can actually sequence fragments of DNA. And so we can sequence specimens from collections that were collected a long time ago. And so there's all of these ways in which these specimens can inform science far into the future in ways that I couldn't even imagine now. There will be technologies and scientific breakthroughs that will allow us to use them. Um, and I often tell kids this, in my pop-up museum, I have a few specimens that have been dead as way longer than I've been alive. There's a butterfly in my pop-up museum collection that was killed in 1947. That's 30 years before I was even born. So, you know, that specimen is, is have had a lot of value as a, as a specimen before I was born. And then now it's being used to educate children and adults and people all over. And as long as I keep taking care of it and hopefully somewhere in the future, somebody will inherit it. Um, so it, it is an ethical dilemma. I try not to, um, I don't collect much anymore at this point. I have a perfectly good insect collection. Um, I don't, with all of these guys here, um, I do have a few things that are local, like a Jeru if I find a Jerusalem cricket in my neighborhood and you know, I, I'll keep that and take care of it. But as far as like all my tarantulas and things, I only buy captive bread um, and that'll cost more, but it means that people aren't going and smuggling insects and spiders in from the tropics and selling them. So I, I make sure I I know reputable breeders. I, I I know people that I can get them from that where they're captive bred. Does that? I hope that answers your questions. I welcome. I love it when people ask me ethically challenging questions because so many people could care less about ethics when it comes to insects, right? Like a lot of people will squish anything, and so I I, I love when people have empathy for them in a way that is not necessarily taught to us. Okay, great. Um... So question Asher age four wants to know if you have a favorite insect. Also curious if you have researched indigenous um, science knowledge of insects. Uh, we say there is much unknown, but are we saying unknown to Western science? That's it. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Okay. So I want to know what is it Asher was what's his name? Yeah, name? Asher wants to know if you have a favorite insect. I want to know what Asher's favorite insect is too. I, you know, I go, it's hard. It's one of the hardest questions for me. It's like, what? I, I have trouble answering it. I really love weevils. And as you know, those are that really diverse group of beetles. Um, weevils have these long snouts and they have little mandibles at the ends of the snouts and they have these little elbowed antennae. And they're just, they're so incredibly diverse. And there are some just beautiful, oh, I can... I have sitting on top of my table over here, we just was drawing a bunch of different clown weevils. So, you know, to give you an idea, this is a group of weevils called clown weevils. And they have all these, you know, different colors and patterns. They're all kind of the same shape. And then they, they just do these like, you know, crazy, crazy metallic and fun little, this one even has a little heart on it. So um, yeah, I, I love, I like weevils a lot. I'm going to go with weevils for, for mantis. the praying mantis. Oh, can I show you a praying mantis? Hold on, everybody. Hold on. We're going to see a praying mantis. Let's see sure. a crazy praying mantis. Look at this guy. This is a giraffe mantis that I'm raising right now. It looks like a little stick. What? Isn't that cool? This is a Southeast Asian species. Oh, hold on. There it is. Did you say a flower mantis? Praying. <laughs> oh yeah, praying mantis. Yeah, I had a flower mantis and she passed away a few weeks ago. So I had to say goodbye, um, but she was really, really, really beautiful. Um, actually, I can show her to you because I can her. Let me show her to you. I could take all these supporting pins out because she's dry. Isn't she beautiful? Oh. And mantises are hard because they only live about a year for their whole life cycle from 
hatching out of the egg. And so you get them and you fall in love with them and you, they become really good teaching animals. And then, and then eventually you have to move on. <laughs> so that's why I have the other little mantises that I'm raising. Oh, and then the other question, I love that other question. Yeah, right, because taxonomy is, um, as we talk about it as scientists, is totally a European colonial thing, right? And so I, I actually have a point with my high school class where we discuss about how there's this idea that somehow like Linnaeus was the first person to think about classifying things <laughs> and that that's not true, that, you know, the human beings classify things. I mean, you're, you're a kid, you probably have something that you know a ton about. Like I've met kids who know every dinosaur or every car or every airplane. And we love categorizing things and some people more so than others, right? And if you're a person, an indigenous person who relies on the land and on nature and lives very closely with it, you better be able to communicate about the plants and animals around you with other people because it could mean life or death, right? Um, so yeah, I really think that there are better ways that we can decolonize taxonomy. Um, I think we're kind of stuck with the Linnaean system of naming things, but yes, like to say that no human being has ever discovered this beetle in the Amazon, that might be true. It may be a little bark beetle that's up in the canopy that, you know, you don't, wouldn't see walking on the ground otherwise, and it has no purpose for us otherwise. Um, but it is very egocentric to consider that just because a scientist hasn't seen it, that humans don't know about it at all, right? So I really, yeah, yeah. And I'm open to any suggestions you have about how to, I've been trying to present it better in my classes too, for that reason. Okay, and I think I see maybe one last question here. Of course, this might have a, <laughs> there's a lot you can answer for this, so maybe one or two examples, but when, what insects are not native to California that still live here? Oh, I mean, a lot, a lot, right? We saw that devil's coach horse beetle, one of my favorites, totally not native to here. Um, honeybees, so, right? This is a great segue into that one. Um, I, I, I didn't have time to go too much into bees, but when we talk about saving the honeybee, it is to an entomologist the equivalent of saying that we need to save the cow. Honeybees are a domesticated agricultural animal that is imported from Europe. They are not native. They have, yeah, they are very valuable, especially in California. I mean, it's crazy if anybody is, I went to Davis, right? If you drive through any part of the Central Valley, you see beehives stacked up everywhere and it's this huge industry and it's incredibly important to our food supply. Honeybees are not native. And in fact, they compete with our native bee species. And we have thousands of native bee species in California, beautiful, amazing native bee species, most of which are ground nesting. Again, going back to leaving the leaves in your garden. Um, and you can learn about some of these species too on those deep look programs. So, I mean, that's a huge one. So we need to kind of have a better discussion around saving the bees so we understand what we're talking about because I'm not all that worried about the honeybee. Um, I'm worried about the native bee species. Um, and then, yeah, a lot of the things that you see, the most common mantises you see are um, Chinese mantises. You, can probably guess where they are from, or European mantises. Again, you can probably guess where they're from. Um, we have some, we have native ladybugs. Some of the ladybugs you see around here are introduced species. Um, and ants are a huge one that's been a problem. Um, any of you who've had these really tiny little Argentine ants invade your house, maybe know about those. They're from Argentina. They're an invasive species. They're very good at invading our houses because they can have multiple queens in their colonies. Um, and they have started to be displaced by another invasive species of pavement ant, which is really interesting to kind of see that happen. Meanwhile, we have so many native ants in California and really you aren't seeing very many of these at all in any urban or slightly urban areas. You really have to go out into the wild to see our native California ant species. So um, yeah, we have a lot of, I mean, just like think about our state and all the eucalyptus and all of these other, invasive plants that are iconic of our state, right? Like you can't not see eucalyptus around here. 
Um, so unfortunately, because of our climate, we've introduced a lot of a lot of non-native insects from around the world. And, and some of them have been a bigger problem than others. Yeah, that could be a, a long topic. <laughs> Well, definitely, certainly, but that was a great answer. So I think that that brings us to the end of our questions here that I see in the chat. And I think that might be the end of our program here. I want to thank everybody for sticking on, especially Stephanie late here. Those were some great questions and some great answers. Yeah. And again, thank you so much um, for joining and thank you, Stephanie, for being here giving this presentation. I'll go ahead and put a link to your website in the chat if people want to. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah. And I'll say to anybody who came in later, I've 26 library programs in the San Mateo County Libraries coming up this summer. Those are mostly for children. Hopefully we'll start to put adult programs on the calendar again as well. Let the library know that you'd like that and I'll do more programs for adults as well. Yeah. 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 Right. Thank you. Thank so you everyone. Awesome. I love I love being here with all of you. Have a good rest of your weekend. Stay cool. <laughs> yeah.